Okay, I am recording anytime you're ready, sir. Okay, well, welcome everybody. It's good to at least see you in this format. And uh, we'll go ahead and get started. I'm looking over here because I have to read this statement as most of you have heard a thousand times now. Uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, state of emergency and Governor Bashir's executive orders regarding social distancing, this meeting is being held by a teleconference pursuant to Senate Bill 150 as signed by the governor on March the 30th, 2020, and Attorney General Opinion 20-05, and in accordance with KRS 61.826, because it is not feasible to offer a primary physical location for the meeting. Uh, Chris, add Ann Tyler to your list. Very good. So, um, so with that, uh, We'll go on to the approval of the summary from the June 18th uh, meeting. You've had a chance to review those. Uh, if there's no corrections, I would entertain a motion to approve. I move. I move. Jordan, who was the second? Brian. I don't even, I'm looking for Brian now. <laughs> oh, I see you, Brian, your photo's not on. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, Aye. we're good to go. Um, Chris, add Michael Bayer to your list as well, and Brian, and Victoria. So with that, Wes, uh, you want to go ahead and talk about the request you've had and... Sure. Um, one, uh, one of the things that the mayor did as part of um, response for um, for the pandemic is to do a deferral of 90 days for our jobs fund loan payments. Um, as we've circled back around with um, with some of the businesses that have loan agreements with the city through the jobs fund, the there's been a request to get an additional 90 days from some of them. Um, and so what what this would essentially do um, would just be to delay uh, delay their payment until sometime in October, early November, as opposed to payments being due now. Questions for Wes? Wes, you might have answered this, but was that interest and principal or partial deferments or complete this would this would be a, a total there were, the initial action was for a total deferment and then uh, this would just be um, the requests have been for the same for another essentially 90 days total deferment gotcha thank you yeah. and my, uh, my question is really not on the uh, deferment but uh, so I'll wait I'll wait to that I, I have a question regarding uh people involved in other parts of a lfucg business so let's get through that first so wes what do you need from us i'm not hearing a lot of questions um i guess it's wait, what, uh, one thing kevin and i talked about was um and this is for our bankers um on the board we wanted to get some insight as far as what um what sort of actions you you all might be taking or seeing um, related to loan deferments, and then um, also I uh, see if the board wanted to provide um, a, an additional ninety day deferral, or if we wanted to go ahead and begin uh, collecting on our loan payments um, just after the initial deferment. So um, I'm a banker and um, at City National, we've done multi multiple loan deferrals, um, interest only or full payment deferrals. And typically the, we do it three months at a time, but six months is kind of after six months, we really need to have a game plan. Mm -hmm. And Victoria, if I can ask mm -hmm. kind of when, you, when you're gonna get to that point, what are you gonna ask them for as, as re in regard to a game plan? So we have a questionnaire we have them fill out um, and it talks about pre-COVID and then it, they lay out the steps that they're going to take during COVID or, you know, to kind of 
as much as they can plan. We also will look and we ask for what their cash reserves are. Um, and then we have them, if they are able, we have them provide financial statements before and then during and continue to do that monthly. So we monitor them. We're really looking to make sure that, you know, they're conserving their cash. They're doing just the bare minimum that they need to do as far as um, on real estates where you're seeing a lot of it, the deferments. Did that answer your question? Yes. Wes, what do you think? Yeah. I can provide the form for you. It's very simple. It's a COVID questionnaire form. That would be helpful. Okay. Wes and Kevin, I'll just echo what Victoria said. Our, our process is very similar. We're just sort of taking them case by case, but, you know, the process is similar to what she just laid out. Mm -hmm. Amanda, you're trying to jump in. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm on my phone, so I'm, I'm not near a computer. Um, so I think that's really helpful advice. And maybe the recommendation would be that if we do approve 90 days, that we also ask for when we talk to the people who are asking for that deferment for their game plan to be provided, it won't go past this point. Mm -hmm. that maybe there's some kind of, um, you know, we're, we're willing to do the 90 days to help plan, but we, we, we won't go past that date A, and we need to know that you're going to have a plan within the next 30 days on how you're going to manage it past this initial 30. Does that make sense? I like that, Wes. Yeah. What do you think? I agree. Now, remember, banks can go up to six months. We just like to do it in 90-day increments. Mm -hmm. So remember that maybe that, you know, it's going to take a little bit of time for them. Jordan but that, and Victoria, that makes sense. go ahead, Amanda, go ahead. Well, that, that makes sense. We've already done 90 days, right? So this is an extension yeah. of yeah, the 90 days, right. which would get us that's to right. six months. Okay. That's right. You're right. You're right. Sorry. So from a banking standpoint, both Jordan and Victoria, have you all had any discussions? What if we're still in this kind of, downturn at the end of the six months what you all may do or are you just going to kind of ride That's this what, phrase no, we, and, we, no we're not going to ride we've got a few uh, about a month and a half left i think on the initial um deferments and that's what we're trying to figure out now a lot of it's with uh, around the hotel industry mm -hmm. we've got to figure out what to do but as soon as i find out i will pass that information on Okay. Case so by case on our side, too. I don't think there's been a, a definite answer. I think we're, we're just looking at specific industries and then coming up with a game plan for what to do when that time comes. So Wes, what else do you need? Do you need a motion or are you, are you good? Yeah, if we, if we had a motion, that would be, um, that would be helpful just to, to allow us to have a further 90 days based on a request and a game plan by the, um, by the requesting company. Do we have a motion? I'll motion that. Make a motion. I'll, I'll second it. Any further discussion? And Stephen and Liz, you're on a second screen. So if I don't see you just kind of jump in. Uh, okay, no further discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Now I'll go skip back to Wes. I thought you might need to jump out. I didn't know what your schedule was. Um, so we'll go back to item two on the agenda and which is bringing in our, our economic development partners. I will say that we've had good meetings over the last couple of weeks with with all our team members. And I think everybody's excited about uh, the coming year. And so what we did was uh, Craig and I asked each one of them to come and tell you all a little bit in about five minute snippets about what they are going to be doing this year, leave some time in there for you all to ask questions as well. And then we'll go on to the next one. And then we are going to just do these in alphabetical order. So Jenna, I see you on my screen and go right ahead. All right, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Jenna Greathouse. I've been with Commerce Lexington um, or Lexington United, the previous economic development group now for um, 
10 years at Lexington United, 15 at Commerce Lexington doing economic development for the region in Lexington. I have on the call, there I see Katie, Tyrone, Betsy. I'm not sure if Cheryl is on the call or not. Yeah. Um, because she is on vacation, but anyway, we also have Cheryl Cleaver, um, and I, um, I've, I've been doing work for the region now, like I said, for 25 years, recruiting new business, working with expanding companies, and um, the last 10 years doing a lot with entrepreneurship. Um, the goal now um, for our team, given the contract, is um, we will be focusing on um, existing businesses, which are frankly going to be needing the most help at the moment, and then talent, our talent attraction strategy, which Betsy will be doing. But I'm going to let each one of them have a quick hop in one minute so we don't use up all our time and then open it up to questions. But again, looking forward to doing existing business, and we'll still be working on our recruiting initiatives for the region and um, and for Lexington too, in partnership with Aaron, we hope, and, and look forward to working with Ed and the team on Opportunity Zones and how we can help Ed and um, PG and his team as well. So who's up? Katie, you want to go first? Sure. Hi, I'm Katie Vandegrift. I'm the Director of Marketing and Research. Um, I started here about a year ago, the end of September. And I manage our real estate database for the region, um, answer any requests for information, um, update our marketing materials, the website, social media, kind of just a little bit of everything. Um, so that's, that's me. And I will add recently promoted to that position, correct? Correct. As of August 1st. So hit the ground running. Betsy? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Betsy Dexter. I'm the executive director of the Business and Education Network, which is a nonprofit within Commerce Lexington. And I'm tasked with doing workforce development, talent pipeline management. I work very closely with our education institutions. Uh, we're working right now on trying to get some data to better understand what the workforce is going to look like over the next couple of years so that we can ensure that the pathways in our school systems are aligned to the needs of our businesses. So I work very closely with um, Bay County Public Schools, UK, BCTC, others, on trying to make sure that the alignment is there. So that's really my role at Commerce Lexington um, is around that talent pipeline, talent development, workforce development, and education. So thank you all for your support. And I look forward to uh, sharing with you what we're going to learn over the next few months. So thanks. Cheryl Cleaver is also on the call. I don't see her, but I know she's there. Here. Cheryl? Hey, y'all. I'm Cheryl Cleaver, Project Manager for Economic Development. Um, I started September as, along with Katie, and my primary focus is business retention and expansion by regularly meeting with existing businesses and in various industries within Fayette County. So our goal is to learn about their operations, challenges, and successes. Uh, we provide a wealth of resources, programs, and services to support and encourage expansion opportunities, and we serve as a liaison between the company and uh, the state chamber and the uh, state, the cabinet for economic. And then Tyrone is there somewhere. I'm here. Good morning again, everybody. Uh, I'm Tyrone Tyra. Uh, my job is uh, Senior Vice President for Community and Minority Business Development here at Commerce Lexington. Uh, I work with uh, minority businesses and uh, women-owned businesses in uh, various areas to uh, help them move along in their, uh, in their processes and growing their opportunities. And uh, we have a loan program called the Access Loan Program, which is now uh, in the midst of uh, administering uh, $2.5 million for the cities. Economic Stimulus Grant Program, which is uh, which is pretty crazy right now. So we're we're having fun. Thanks. Jenna, you're muted. Yep, sorry. <laughs> that does it for our partners on our team. Um, you'd think after three, four months of Zoom calls, I could remember to unmute, but. Um, so we're ready and anxious to get rolling where we've got, I think this week, 
Cheryl has six existing business calls um, and we are ready to roll. Questions for Jenna and her team, maybe? I got a question. Go ahead, Rich. Jenna, you, know, you know, some of some of you new ones that don't know who I am. I've been on the council for too damn long. But anyway, I look at the money and I, I'm worried about what this coronavirus, I commend you for what you all are doing to try and protect to save the businesses. With this coronavirus, the business industry is changing a lot. And I have concerns about what's going to happen in the next couple of years. I have my couple of my colleagues want to raise taxes, payroll taxes, and some of you all sitting up there, not a good word to have right now. And I'm afraid with this new structure, a lot of people are starting to work from home and may move out of state. And I, my biggest fear that we may end up being a lot, because I'm a money kind of guy. I think next year, 2022 is going to be terrible for our budget. We're going to have to tap into a rainy day fund, and that's going to be an easy way for some of my colleagues to want to raise the taxes. As some of you know, I'm a big interstate guy, Jenna. We got to see a tunnel with the light. I haven't seen no tunnel with the light, and I want to give an opportunity for you all if we can help you. As I look at this pandemic up in the north, and I see people who sit on a train for an hour to get to work and come back an hour and have to do thousands of people every day, I just try to figure out how we can sell this product here in Lexington on the interstate where people can live here and, and, be, and, and be at work at home in 20 minutes, and they don't have to live in Fayette County, because telling you, buy, building houses don't help my budget. It may help temporary, but at the end of the day, it becomes a problem. We can't, we don't get payroll tax to pay the police and fire. The only thing that's going to protect us is, pay, is jobs. How can we sell that product, and what do we have to do? This tech council has to send a message, either raise taxes or we're going to have to start building on the interstate and have a message that Lustons is one of the best places in the country to live, especially during the pandemic. And knowing if they can get a job here on the interstate and drive 20 minutes to Montgomery County or one of those counties and have a 5,000 square foot house for the same price that they're paying for 1,200 square foot in apartments. I think we got so many opportunities still here. I just, I'm just worried and I'm glad to be on this committee and some of you may be saying, well, he's going a different direction. I just, I think to me, we've got to take this to another level. And I commend you all for saving these businesses what we have right now, but these businesses are not going to be able to protect our budget the next year. We've got to create new money. And without new jobs coming here, you're all going to lose a lot of these jobs if they move out of the county. So. I'm asking you, and I don't care my colleagues, and my, it gets me beaten at time. I could care less, but I want to know what we have to do. I know that sewers already on the interstate that are outside the urban service, which we got to somehow, and I, I will go pitch if I have to. Do you think if we give, what would you need for us to help you to go out and sell your product to show lessons in it for the greatest place to live and bring jobs here? Well, we have to have product. So um, that's our biggest issue. Now, Coldstream has the potential here soon when we could get the infrastructure for it, get it paid for. The current situation is land lease only. Um, land that is currently available is very expensive. Um, you know, property owners can charge what they want. Uh, so my personal opinion is, I mean, that's a decision the city will have to come to, you know, do we need to expand the urban service boundary? Where is that? Where's the need? How is it the easiest way to do it? And if it gets done, um, you know, we've always encouraged expansions for job growth for economic development or inside or outside the boundary. And we came to a conclusion last time with the land swap that was intended to solve the problem, but you know, given the situation with the city's revenue, I think it's going to be harder to get that done faster. Um, so we need to sell that 50 acres in Coldstream and hopefully use that money to help pay for the other 200 in that turkey neck um, or find some other solution at some point. But I just think it's a big um, a situation that will have to be addressed in the next two years as the comp plan process comes on. 
Um, my biggest concern, and I think you're right in thanking this council member, um, seeing companies leave Lexington right now. So it's not just finding places for new ones. Our, our product is very limited in terms of current available land and even buildings. So buildings are being snapped up left and right as well. So we're keeping up with it. We've got great relationships with all the brokers, um, but it, we just don't have a lot of product to sell here. Um, so I, we keep a database here that says, is this a flight? We call it flight risk. If someone has said, I'm, lo I'm personally looking outside of Fayette County, we know who those companies are. And I just think you have to think about it. I don't think they're going to necessarily, all of them are going to leave, but they're definitely some looking at options. Um, that's, that's my fear. And I'm a money guy, just like you. I want to see the city's tax base grow and um, nobody wants to see their taxes increased. Um, but some, some, somehow something's going to need to be addressed. And I think right now everybody just doesn't know exactly what to do. Well, I'm glad you bring that. We, we have a Bible called the Rural Land Management plan and I was on the council a long time ago before some of you kids were born but anyway uh, I was the last one to vote to expand the boundaries and there was a rule said for the this is that was 25 years ago almost and now we're coming to the point we need to go in that rural land managed Bible and that is going out the interstate out on Winchester Road and 64. Now you all see the mess we have on Nicholsville Road and if there was an interstate on the side of Nicholsville Road, how wonderful that would have been. And when I talk to my colleagues in Nicholsville, they're going, God, which we had an interstate like Winchester does. I think there's the opportunity there that we just need to be more aggressive. And I'm telling you, the message we need to send out of this committee is we're doing a good job trying to keep our jobs here. And trying, I think you commend all of you. But if we keep going this pace, those jobs will go away because when it comes to some of my colleagues, they're going to raise taxes and these jobs that you and I just are going to leave. Now, if we can send a message out of this committee that we see potential, we see a, a opportunity, a learning process that we learned from Nicholsville Road, that we have a chance to do it right on Winchester Road, and we're following the guidelines of the rural land management, that the future is the next, whatever we decide to go, which is now. So I ask you all that if we can help somehow, and I know my colleagues on the, I think she, she's uh, kind of agreed that we got to find jobs. And uh, hopefully if you all give us an idea, we can probably go sell back to our colleagues and say, guys, <laughs> you got a choice. We got a chance to build up here and put on this interstate. If you can bring ideas like that to us, I want to be able to sell, to sell it to my book, to the camp, my colleagues to show this is the, the only uh, option we have. Thank you, well, Honorable Member. Not. Jenna, we're, we're going to have to move on because of time. Uh, but, but Richard... Uh, Go ahead, I'm done. Uh, no, you're, we're going to move on. PG and Ed, uh, so as you all know, we have uh, contracted with EHI, who is Ed Holmes, which probably everybody on this call knows, and his colleague uh, from the Urban League, PG, who everybody I'm sure also knows. Uh, so not sure which one of you all wants to take the lead, but jump in and tell us a little bit about what you all are going to do. Okay, I'll, PG's still muted, so while he gets unmuted, I'll... Uh, Unmute, PG. PG, you're muted. PG, we can't hear you. He's I'll rolling. <laughs> he he is on a roll. <laughs> He's rolling. We can't hear a thing. Uh, Ed, Ed, why don't right. you start? And maybe Anissa can get PG's attention. Once, once we get PG uh, unmuted, I'll get started. Uh, like Kevin said, we're doing the Opportunity Zone segment of this project. And uh, we're first we're going to do is uh, identify neighborhoods that fall within the Opportunity Zone and neighborhoods that I know the Urban League and myself have worked in for years. And that part is uh, part of that's going to be gathering the data. We need to know what's in the neighborhoods, uh, what's the available land use, what's available infill, and areas that we can provide some development opportunities for, and also tell the story of of economics uh, that's impacted the communities there, 
uh, low to um, the moderate neighborhoods that are changing. And that's the role I know PG is going to bring in his efforts with the neighborhood in transition. But, uh, you know, how do you bring viable, sustainable opportunities to uh, neighborhoods that are going uh, some pretty significant systemic changes? And uh, so that's going to be the challenge that, that we see in these opportunity zones. And then you, you combine that with the uh, economic hits the neighborhoods are taking with the COVID uh, pandemic, it, it makes it even doubly hard to uh, try and create a, some some type of change. So it's about, you know, looking at what we've done in these communities and how we can can make some pretty significant, um, create some opportunities. So uh, PG, now that you're unmuted, I'll let you <laughs> talk about Am I? I'm, can you hear me now? You are good. <laughs> no, I, I was going to say was that uh, yeah, there's not much need for any introductions of any of us. You guys know us all. Uh, Urban League um, been involved in this community with affordable housing since about 1984. And we got involved in that because of Ed Holmes, who had moved the town as with a background in planning. And he was the one that came to me and said, this is something you ought to be looking at. Got us first connected with Kentucky Housing and the rest is history of uh, uh, the amount of housing that we've done thanks to thanks to Ed's leadership. So it was, it was natural that we would form a partnership to go after, go after these funds. Uh, and uh, you know, myself and Anissa, and I'll let Anissa, I'll step aside and Anissa tell a little bit about herself and her role gonna, that's gonna be in this operation. Good morning, everybody. My name is Ennis Franklin here with the Urban League as well. Uh, my role in this is to help with reporting and making sure that we're staying on track. Uh, when I introduce myself all the time, I always say that I am the all other duties as assigned. So if there's anything that our team needs, I am happy to fill that need so that we uh, do exactly what we need to do for this thing. Okay, Ryan, you want to talk to him from the technology aspect of what we're going to do? Yes, I'm Ryan Holmes with EHI Consultants. I'm a planner with the company and been involved in a lot of the smaller data plans around Washington. And so my background is kind of in the data analytics, GIS kind of specializations. And so basically what, what I'm doing right now is trying to get an understanding of what's in, within the opportunity zone itself. Um, what are the housing needs? What are the market conditions look like? Um, what are the existing tools that we can kind of leverage? And so really my role right now is just pulling in all of that data and really start to especially map, uh, map this out and kind of tell a story as far as long as we um, start to put these roadmaps to readiness uh, neighborhood handbooks together. So Ed, just real quick, you and PG, we, we talked about the opportunity zone. For those who may not uh, kind of follow that stuff on a daily basis, tell us a little bit about how you're going to do that in conjunction with the Neighborhood in Transition Committee. and trying to marry those two objectives. Hey, PG, do you want to? Yeah, no, as far as the neighborhood, um, I, I think that they're both coming alive at about the same time. Uh, the Neighborhood and Transition um, Task Force has been in existence now since 2018 and uh, has been uh, uh, really just spending a lot of time meeting with people in the neighborhoods. Uh, not a whole lot new information coming out of that, but uh, what we do know is that uh, if we don't pay attention to these recommendations that's coming, that's bubbling to the top out of these neighborhoods and transitions, um, we won't be talking about opportunity zones. We'll be talking about trouble zones. That's what we'll be talking about because there's some serious issues out there with these neighborhoods and serious issues with people living in these neighborhoods. Hopefully, uh, there'll be opportunities to marry uh, what the Opportunities on Concept is about to some of the needs uh, of, of these uh, neighborhoods. Yeah, I think PG's right on with that. And uh, they're, they're vulnerable neighborhoods. And yeah. we've probably done neighborhoods the neighborhood plans for three or four of those neighborhoods and they, they are they are in they are in transition they're changing so how do we you know maintain or create some sense of 
a viable, affordable neighborhoods that uh, that are in here. And uh, opportunity zones could have a negative effect if we start, uh, you know, moving residents out and creating something right. that that uh, would be harmful to them. So how do you maintain and sustain viable, affordable neighborhoods and yet create some economic opportunities through jobs in the economy? And so that's going to be the challenge. And um, we can show you, I think, through through our visual graphics and mapping uh, where those areas are. Now, how do you protect them is going to be the challenge. One or two questions for PG and Ed and their team. I have a question. Um, I noticed you all met with somebody from PNC about the Opportunity Zones. Could you expand on that a little bit more? And then I don't want to speak for Victoria, but I know that our bank would like more information and would love to meet with you all going forward too to see how we can assist in your efforts. Yeah, we're, we're just getting started and, and PNC was just one that came up on our radar. Uh, I think the next phases will be to start to, to identify other lenders that, that may have an interest, uh, but you also have to marry that up with uh, developers that may have an interest as well. But um, we're, we're just getting started, I think, this is probably our third week of, of the of the contract. So, but yeah, we'll when we did this report, we were 18 days into it. So, understood. Well, we're we're happy to help any way we can. Just just let us know. Okay, appreciate we'll it. do. Appreciate. It. Yeah, be careful what you ask for. <laughs> <laughs> because you you will hear from us. Thank you. Not hearing anyone else, we'll shift up to our final partner for this year. Uh, some of you may know Aaron Persley, who used to be at the Kentucky Cabinet for Economic Development. Uh, he has his team uh, on here as well. And so Aaron has been charged with doing our new business uh, recruitment and development, as well as our minority business uh, development for the, the coming year. So. Aaron, introduce yourself and your team, please. I will do that. Thank you, Kevin. I appreciate it. So, yes, I am the new kid uh, on the block. Uh, just some background about myself. Um, again, I grew up in Lexington, Kentucky. I uh, left here after high school, went to Washington, D.C. Uh, for about 20 years, 20 plus years. And then we came back home to Lexington about three years ago. Um, so, as background, I have about 30 years of experience in international trade, and economic development, both in the U.S. and overseas. Of course, I served here as a commissioner of business development, so I know the state well. Uh, my true background is in international trade and foreign direct investment, and that's in attracting companies to relocate into the United States and into Kentucky uh, and across the U.S., quite frankly. Um, my teams uh, over the years have done over gosh, I think about 32 to 37 billion uh, in foreign direct investment uh, into the US. So I'm going to talk about our program, what we're doing, and as I go through each phase, we'll talk about the team members who are gonna be part of that program. So our first assignment is new business development and attracting and attraction. So writing the new business strategy for Fayette County and then helping to figure out how we're going to attract new companies into the area based on some of Councilmember Maloney's concerns about needing to bring in new money and new jobs into the area. Part of that's going to be attracting companies that are already existing. Part of that will be through entrepreneurship, building new companies in Fayette County and possibly surrounding areas as well. Because in my concept, when we build regionally, we also help Lexington as well. Kentucky may be a manufacturing state, but Fayette County, I see, and we're going to try to promote as the new innovation and technology hub in the U.S. So a focus on attracting those new high-level research, innovative, technology-focused jobs and companies that sometimes don't have the same level of numbers as manufacturing companies but do bring in equal or more money into the county. I also want to say that as part of this, you have to realize that trade investment is an ecosystem. We can't do new business development without working with 
Commerce Lexington on new business retention. We can't do economic development without working with our friends at the Urban League and EHI on opportunity zones because some of these companies want to go into opportunity zones. So I want to state that our focus is to make sure that we coordinate all of our work together and create this ecosystem of economic development for Fayette County. And so let me go through my team members to save time. I'm going to introduce them. Some are on the line, some are not. But those who are on the line, you're welcome to ask some questions as we go through this. So first, I'm going to talk about Joe Willie. Joe Aaron, Willie. Aaron, can you pause for just a second? Yeah. Jason, I believe we're getting feedback. Can you put yourself on mute? Thank you, sir. Go right ahead. Thank you. So I'm going to go through and introduce my team. So Joe Lilly, who is going to be our marketing and PR person, part of this concept has to be how are we going to market Lexington around the country and around the world to attract new investment? Joe Lilly has experience uh, working in Kentucky for quite some time, 40 years of marketing and PR experience. Two campaigns you may know of that he worked on were Unbridled Spirit campaign for Kentucky and the Think Kentucky campaign. He helped design those campaigns for the state of Kentucky. And we are currently, in fact, later this afternoon, finalizing our draft marketing plan for Fayette County so that we can give it to you to review, to show how we want to market and position Fayette County um, globally and domestically. So that should be to you by the end of this month. Next on our team, who's also on this call, is Gabriella, Gabriella Morales. Now, Gabriella has over 17 years of experience working with small and minority businesses, as well as a background in international trade and foreign direct investment. So a lot of our work with the small and minority businesses will be handled by Gabriella. That will be direct counseling with these businesses and a series of 101 Zoom and webinar trainings for these companies to help them find financing, to learn how to expand their business, to learn how to attract angel investors into their business and to grow and expand their businesses here in um, the county. Next on our team is Jason Neal. Now, Jason Neal also, who's on the line, uh, has a great background as well. I worked with Jason Neal at the Cabinet for Economic Development. He was a project manager, and he'll be working directly with me as we start the new year on new business development. Once you have approved our new business strategy, we'll bring Jason on board to assist me with going out there, attracting new businesses, and then showing them sites and buildings in and around um, the county. Once again, I will echo what um, Jenna has said. Product is a problem. We need more product. We need more places to place these companies. However, I do see within this also an opportunity. And the opportunity is this. As more companies start to think about how they're going to have their employees working remotely, how do we capitalize on exactly that and use this as an opportunity to market Lexington? And here's one of the theories we're working on, one of the marketing campaigns we're working on as a place to live and grow in Lexington. So not only do we attract people who are working here in the area or the region, but also how do we get people to move from other areas if they work remotely to come and live in Kentucky or in Lexington because we have the perfect place to live. The great scenery, the great livelihoods, the great communities where people want to live, the low cost of living compared to Washington, D.C., California, New York, New Jersey, areas like that. How can we start to attract those people who in the future will be working from home to come and work and live in Lexington, which also creates an economic development ecosystem? That's one of our plans that we're looking at as well as we move forward. Now, also on our team is Jason Rainey, who is not on the call right now. Jason Rainey uh, is the owner of, um, his company is called, let me get it correct, Estate Real Estate, a real estate firm here in Kentucky, Excellent Real Estate, I think it's what's Executive Real Estate, excuse me. So Jason runs Executive Real Estate here in Kentucky. He'll be handling our commercial property uh, inventory. So we hope to work with Katie and the Commerce Lexington team to find out what they have. Our goal is not to recreate the wheel. Our goal is to work with our partners and maximize what we have 
and take it to the next level. Uh, last week, I met with the Kentucky Cabinet for Economic Development and the Zoom Prospector team, which is kind of the sites and buildings team for the state. And what we did was figure out how we can connect whatever we do in Fayette County with the state commercial system as well. So we're marketing our properties at the state and local level as much as we possibly can to get as many views and looks as we possibly can from potential clients that may be uh, coming to Lexington or considering moving to Kentucky uh, in general. And then last on our team is our millennial. We have Sonia Gibbs who's on our team and she's also on the call. Part of our strategy is about social media. How do we get more looks at Fayette County? And Sonia Gibbs is our millennial and also, by the way, has had her own company since she was in high school doing digital marketing. Uh, will be working with us on how do we best position our county in social media to get the attraction, the attention, to bring in more sites, more companies, more people who want to take a look at Fayette County. And uh, I've probably talked too long, so please excuse me. Uh, I'm known to do that. I apologize. So I'll open up to any questions at this time. Maybe one question for Aaron and his team before we switch on to the next topic. Any questions? Uh, see Council Member Bledsoe. Thank you. I'll be real quick. Um, thank you, Mr. Persley, for that lengthy um, and helpful introduction for your team. I don't, I don't know most of your team outside of Jason just a little bit, so appreciate that. Um, you mentioned regionalism, and one of the criticisms that we have seen around around from others is that regionalism is great, but if they're not paying payroll in, pay, in Fayette County, it really doesn't help us at the bottom line. You know, state, um, th those taxes don't help us as much if it's not working in Fayette County. So can you just maybe clarify or maybe just talk a little bit more about how you envision regionalism and working together for the benefit of Fayette County, specifically on payroll? Um. When it comes to payroll, it may not have be a direct contributor to the county. But here's where I think as we position the county, we're talking about how we position the county. When we talk about Lexington as a place to live and grow, maybe you have your company in Bourbon County, but you're going to come to Lexington. We're going to attract you to do your business, your restaurant, your outings in Lexington, Fayette County area. Maybe you work somewhere else in surrounding county, but you live in Lexington. Those real estate taxes do help the economic development of our area as well. So payroll taxes, yes, no, but we don't have the land for, you know, a 300,000 square foot facility that's going to do marketing, nor I will say this personally, as a person who lives in Lexington, I'm not sure I want that big kind of manufacturing in Lexington. But what I do want, I do want them to spend their money in our county. I want them to eat here. I want them to visit here. I want them to go to shows here. That's another ripple effect of having that regionalism effect. No, Toyota is not in Fayette County. However, we benefit greatly for Toyota being in Scott County. And that's what I talk about. When I talk regionalism, I'm talking about that concept, that if this is the place to live and grow, we become the suburb of the region. People will live here and maybe work in the next county. Thanks, Aaron. I think because of time, we're going to go ahead and move on to the next I got a topic. question. Go ahead, Richard. One more question, Richard. Okay. I, I appreciate Councilmember Lester's question there. I I disagree with you. If we can bring jobs here, I don't care how big it is. We need it, uh, period, now. Because housing, as you can ask PG people, is very unaffordable here in Lexington. And people are now starting to move out of the counties to find houses they can afford. My question is, when I look at the report, I see a lot of NAs on there. If you all, I just want to know, when you did the RFP, did you all were you able to fill all these things out, or, or, or was this in a process of planning, or you already have some of these things already programmed to do? I, I'm just trying to be curious on that one. Yes, sir. So where you see NA uh, are sections like some things that are actually posted for what happened last month. Being a new company, we just started with this project this month. So some of those things are asking, what did you do last month? What did you do anything last month? Because we just started this month. Uh, also, some of the NAs include things like, uh, one section says, how many commercial properties do you have in the area? Well, we have different information from different sources. And so I put NA and a note in there that 
we want to report that next month once we have gone through all those sources that have different information and kind of pull together to say exactly what we do have as for, in terms of commercial property in and around the state. So those NAs are either things that were reported for last month that would not be applicable to us at this time and the commercial real estate thing we're working on right now. And so our work so far has been in developing the new business strategy and the marketing strategy for uh, the county and starting our meetings with our partners in and around the county as well. So we can make sure that once again, we're not reinventing the wheel. They're working in partnership with all the different partners across the county and the state. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Right. So can now, we, now can I make a quick comment, Kevin? Um, Anthony. Trying to see who's, Anthony, is that you? Yeah, oh, sure. Go right ahead. Thank you. Um, Aaron, it's, it's nice to meet you. This is the first time I've had a chance to, uh, to lay eyes on you. I've seen your name, of course, in the report in which you submitted. Um, one thing that I wanted to bring up is this, this time that we're experiencing right now with COVID and the fact that many of us are working from our homes right now doing this meeting. Uh, what I think is going to get interesting for your commercial real estate guy and other commercial realtors around the city is there's a lot of conversation going on now about do I really need all that office space? And so, you know, while we're talking about, you know, a dearth and, and the ability to find land available, maybe we will find buildings becoming more available just because people are rethinking the way that they want to do business today. Your comments on that, please. I agree 100%. And by the way, one of the meetings I had uh, last week was with the president of the Foundation for Conduit. Uh, they are rethinking how they're going to do business moving forward. What they're saying is the CEO has said, I'm not going back until next year. 80% of his workforce may also continue to work from home because they figured out how they can have secure lines from their home station. That's going to be a big change. Companies like Siemens International have decided, hey, we're not going back to those big office spaces anymore. We're going to try to find out how we work remotely. So you're right. But once again, as we lose businesses and commercial properties, that creates opportunities as well. And so how we position ourselves to look at this not as just a challenge, but an opportunity is going to be what makes us winners at the end of the day. Thanks, Sorry, everybody. And we're going to switch off. Uh, to the topic, uh, which is going to take a little bit of time for discussion, but we want to do it and do it right. Chris, uh, if you're still on, can you switch us to, to the board members on my screen? Yes, sir. The others will be going into the attendees, so they'll be able to hear and see everything, but they will not be able to participate. We're almost there. So, Chris, we've lost a few if you're still with us. I am with you. Uh, I'm looking here. Did we lose uh, Michael Bear? We've we got uh, Ann Tyler Morgan, Brian Wells. Ann Tyler Morgan's still with us. She on a, it's not showing me another screen. Oh, there she is. I see her now. Yeah. Uh, do we st got Michael? I'm not seeing Brian Wells or I see Victoria. So really, the only one I don't see is Brian Wells. Okay, there he is now. Well, now I'm not seeing Brad Patrick either. And okay, 
should be there. Liz Brown has her, Liz Brown Evans has her hand up. Stephen Howard has her hand up. Okay, there's Brad back. Yeah, so you, if you've got Liz and Stephen. I have seen 13 uh, in the panelists. I'm still on my screen not seeing Steve or Liz. Let me check. Okay. I don't... Uh, there is, oh, Steve Howard. Okay. Yeah. My apologies. Okay. And the other one's. The other one's Liz. Yeah, Liz. Okay. There we go. I didn't have them on my list. Okay, that should be everybody. Okay, I see her now. So thanks everybody as we were working through that little technical glitch. So this discussion is one I've been looking forward to for a while. Uh, I think in our council members, I hope would agree. The council has been looking more and more to this group to um, provide strategy uh, and input for our economic development efforts. And this year, Council Member Bledsoe, uh, with the full council support, uh, put in an additional $250,000 for our economic development partners that would be used as a dollar for dollar match to increase our, our activities. So kind of the funding that both Brad and I've emailed you all about, and we've talked about previously, will be allocated just among those three based on some, some general conversation. So we wanted to have kind of a, a strategy among this board uh, and a conversation. And it's one I've wanted to do for a while. And, and in a conversation with Brad, the opportunity presented itself to, to really jump in full board of that conversation. So kind of with that set up, Brad's gonna lead us through this discussion. And, and I want everybody to, to feel free to engage. Uh, I think you saw just now we have three partners who really do want to work together and um, to the betterment of, of this community and, and the money that this government invests in those efforts. So Brad, with that, why don't you, you kind of jump in? Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, you know, this is uh, Kevin and I talked and this is maybe just a different approach, a fresh approach for facilitation. So that's my goal. I, I sent a note to everybody uh, talking about my role is to guide the conversation to extract all the best thinking. Um, but I, and I also gave you permission to uh, provide me feedback, stop, show frustration, or even growl at me too. So that's how these usually work overall um, you know we we've you know we have an opportunity here to help this uh, these committees have additional funding for their work that they do uh, just to get the conversation started and we'll guide from there and to uh, you know at least work for them almost the next hour um, I'm wondering what the uh, board members here believe to be the most urgent issue of all the issues that we've talked about so many things are going on and you have to uh, consider that question in the context of the COVID and the amount of unknown that we're facing. Just to get our conversation started to build on, what is it that we believe if we had to rank and identify the greatest issue uh, that these three organizations are helping us with? What, what, is, what are your thoughts on that? My first thought is schools um, and everything that ties into that with you know, daycare for, for kids, it just, it's just such a domino effect. Um, so I, I'd love to hear feedback from everyone else in terms of how these three groups, how you envision them helping, um, you know, sort of getting school stabilized for, for a better, better term. But I think that's gonna be a huge, huge issue uh, going forward. Yeah, that's a good thought. There's a lot of unknown with that as well, too. So that even adds to it. Other thoughts on that? That do you do we? What do you believe that these three organizations will have an impact on the school aspect of our our challenge? Uh, it's like workforce development, and, yeah. and the question is uh, identifying what are those areas 
those sectors of our economy that are growth areas and making sure that we are training a next workforce to be able to secure jobs and employment in those areas, uh, take some of the things that are natural to our growth, go with that. And then I think you'll also find that there are some intentional things that need to be done as well. I mean, I'm on the mayor's commission uh, and, and actually one of the, the vice chairs for the education and economic outlook, Tyrone serves on that committee with me as well. And, and as we think about um, growing our women and minority owned businesses, um, the, the question is, do we have the skill set? Do we have the capability? Do we have the scale? Do we have the capacity to be able to do the jobs that um, and the projects that that actually people spend money on? The city spends money on the Fayette County Public Schools spends money on that UK spends money on. Is there a way to keep more of that here rather than having to hire someone outside? The, the key is where is the money coming from and and uh, when you talk economic development you got to talk about wealth creation so it needs to be bringing in resources from the outside inside our area and that way we get expansion in that respect housing is a very valuable tool that we have in our community because quite often when you do affordable housing you're bringing money from outside in the way of grants and um, tax credits and the like uh, that bring money in from outside I would say the most important thing we talk about is jobs. This, this COVID situation right now is really, really scary as it relates to the economy. We're gonna have a rough ride for the next year or two. I mean, this is not gonna just turn around overnight. And I know there are some who like to think that that will be the case, but I, I really don't see that happening. And so with that, how do we keep people employed? How do we keep jobs in this community? Because we've gotta keep not only bringing in our tax base and keeping it going, but providing a livelihood for individuals who leave here who are now in the situation where they're, they're panicking. I mean, they, they really don't know what they're going to do. They don't know when they're going to go back to work in many cases. Good. And when I hear you say that, I, I hear comments about maybe this is a more short-term achievable impact we can make. Is there a time aspect in your consideration, knowing that all these topics are important? Do you believe that the, work, the workforce impact is the most short-term high impact thing we can do? Well, I think that you'll have components of a lot of these areas that are short term and also long term. And I think that the strategy has to be looking at both of those. What can we do for quick hits? But at the same time, how do we reposition the community to be able to move forward for growth and opportunity? And that that will be a longer term strategy. But identifying that now is very important. Brian, Liz, comments? Brad, do you Go ahead, Michael. Michael piggyback on on what anthony said just coming from someone that you know owning a couple different small businesses here in town i mean payroll tax is such a big waterfall effect to the overall budget that you know us having to furlough so many people and trying to keep our doors open and you know now we have a, a building that we bought and we fit up a couple years ago and it's beautiful and it's empty you know so like you know, there's all of these, you know, what, what Jordan said was starting at schools and how that trickles down. Like, you know, in some of my other meetings, we're talking about, you know, how parents are even able to go back to work with schools not being open. And so now you've got that happening. So now you've got more and more incentive for people to stay home. Now you have less and less people filling my building. And now I have less and less people working for me and paying payroll tax. So there's this whole, like, waterfall that's happening that if we don't like like stop the spigot from flowing sooner than later a year two years from three years from now we're still going to be having this problem like and, and i'm i'm saying that i'm i'm not that i'm not part of the problem like I, there's some things i can't control at this point in time but but like there's got to be some sort of changes now to stop that the dam from breaking like that's what scares me the most. Well, I, I, I think too, Brad, I think we all ought to have a certain amount of fear because I think that what we've seen from um, women and minority businesses, <clears throat> excuse me, in our conversations is that they, they're going to fall off twice as fast as other opportunities out there. That's, uh, that's number one, uh, because they start out undercapitalized and then, you know, what we're trying to help them with still may not sustain them as they, uh, as they go down the road. And my personal opinion is, is in uh, listening to everything around the country, 
I think the, you know, the jury's still out on distance learning for all kids. When you talk about the equity situation and, and long-term, short-term, we're, that, that could be a huge uh, problem when you look at education and the equity issues that are, that are already out there that are only going to be uh, expanded as we don't get kids in the classroom. Yeah. Liz, thoughts, Brian? I, Ann, I saw your head shake that you heard something you like. What, your thoughts on what we've talked about? Sorry, I never can find that mute button quickly. <laughs> there is a graceful. Lots of practice on Zoom, and still I'm not getting it right. But <laughs> we'll keep trying. Um, no, I agree with everything that's being said. I think the the catapulting effects of what's happening right now put us all in a really unique position. So I'm interested to continue hearing business owners' thoughts on you know how we can improve. And and like Michael said, I mean it's hard to not be contributing to um, difficulties in economic development right now, but um, I think the, that, um, you know, certainly the business owners, the small business owners can speak um, a little more strongly to what's going on. I represent a number of small business owners um, who are dealing with particularly COVID related issues right now. And the unexpectedness of this situation is, um, making life very difficult for business owners. So aside from payroll tax and um, issues that we generally have here in the region in terms of bringing in jobs, um, right now there are many issues with kind of the, the stringency of requirements, which are really necessary. I mean, there's, there's not a lot to be done about, um, you know, having to close a facility due to a positive COVID test or something. So um, I'm very interested to hear other business owners' perspective how to get through such a, a trying time when there's not a lot, um, <laughs> not a lot of control, I guess, is the, the way to put that. Yeah. The, um, well, obviously, you know, there are other groups of people out there will have perspective on how to best use this money. Uh, we're, we've, as a board now, we've so far talked about, you know, impacting employment. What's the counter argument? What, what do we expect to hear when somebody else says this, this other issue is most important? What other issue would, would someone want to counter or have a discussion with us to say that a different issue is more important? I don't know about short term, but I think a short to mid level opportunity that I see. I, I sit in a few of my different jobs at the intersection of I work for a company that hires people coming out of incarceration and addiction. I work with entrepreneurs. And then along with Steven, I'm involved with the builders industry. And I think something that we've seen happening for a long time is, um, and I apologize, I can't remember the name of the woman on Commerce Lex who deals with sort of the flow of, of career tracks and opportunity scene. But I think what these times are showing us is um, a disconnect between the job opportunities that are available. Not all jobs are being lost right now. Some industries still have a lot of openings. Um, and the one that I, in a biased perspective, think of is the building industry. There are still buildings going up. There are still houses being built. I think historically, those have been um, career paths that have been sort of plan B or plan C. And I think that's one example of many of, are there, are there ways that we reframe how we view the workforce, how we view economic opportunity? Um, I think there are a lot of jobs that are not going to come back around for some time, right? Um, and that I, some of those we cannot solve as a Lexington committee in an entire nation. Um, but I think some things we can solve in our region, strengths we do have. And so I'm curious what, and again, I think it's more of a mid-level priority, like childcare for people today is a, is, a, is a huge priority. As a woman, I've got friends with kids and they're facing some really hard decisions in the next weeks, if not months. Um, but I'm wondering, knowing what Commerce Likes and EJI does and, and learning more um, about the other, what, what can we do to reframe what our strengths are as a region as we, as we lean into this season of COVID? And I know I'm being sort of vague, but I think to me, a, a specific example of that is how do we reframe workforce training with education for the, um, I mean, I, we also work with software developers. It's booming right now. We've had more applications than ever at Awesome Inc. for our boot camp. Um, our web development program, because people are learning, people still need software. When everyone's sitting at home, those people still have jobs and they get paid a lot to have those jobs. So 
um, I'm curious, I don't know, I think to get more creative and innovative in how we think about what workforce development looks like. Yeah. I'm hearing a strong theme of workforce development, some support with that. What, what is the counter argument? Who, who, who's going to be concerned that they're going to fall behind if we don't keep them funded and working on the right thing? Is there, is there a challenge? And, you know, Stephen Howard here. I, and right now it's hard to understand exactly uh, how different, all industries are impacted differently. And we see some thriving and we see some, some not. So the one area that I know that we really had to figure out is how this is impacting our children. And I think that uh, outside of the schools, we have um, community centers, community activities, people that mentor children, continuously churches who are trying, who are working to get involved, particularly with the NTI situation and getting parents back to work of saying, bring your kids to us and we'll get their NTI done. We'll, we'll, we'll put them in a classroom setting. Uh, and after that, we will, they'll instantly go into activities for the remaining of the uh, day. And that allows people to get back to work. So, uh, one role of the government is to identify where children uh, spend their extracurricular time and have been and how that has been. Well, an excellent example of that would be KBC and the impact of that business not being open right now and uh, me being involved over there with my son being a basketball player and seeing just how many kids uh, that served and that no longer exists. So that weighs heavily on my mind when I'm thinking about where we are uh, and how we can grow our community. And that's a, that's a responsibility of the government. I think we need to identify those community leaders that uh, work with kids and create more of a public private relationship and bring these experts in. I think there are re big resources available in the community as well. If partnered with the government um, on existing government resources and assets that are available to us. So, so Brad, you know, your question was who would who would not be happy with workforce development? And that's a pretty hard thing to be against, right? I mean, it, it's not it's, it's a very compelling story. Uh, the only thing I guess I would say is when I joined this board, you know, I guess six years ago, I can't remember how many a long time. Um, one of the I, I, I think Congress, uh, excuse me, uh, Council Member Maloney and, um, and Stephen Howard are the only two people that are longer tenured on this board than me, but we initially focused a lot on incentives to particular business applicants to attract them to come here. Uh, in recent years, I think we have focused this board more on workforce development. And I think it was a key, um, I think it's important to do, right? It's, it's an important initiative to have, but the, to answer your question, my only, I guess, thought is should we look at focusing some of these some of this money not just on workforce development but other types of incentives to businesses to attract them here yeah that's the nature of it you know I, you're right people aren't going to be against workforce development however i you know with the conditions that exist today i was kind of poking at the urgency of you know what's the most important in the sense in other words um you know you know, looking at the energy that uh, Council Member Maloney had about bringing businesses into the area, is there a risk of that taking too long? You know, can there be more short-term comments? You know, uh, um, you know, listening to Anthony's comments, you know, I got the sense that there was a, some hope or some belief that some short-term items may be more impactful. You don't want to leave uh, uh, businesses moving into community, but is that fast enough? Is kind of what I was poking at. Uh, Council Member Maloney, what are your thoughts? You've been, you spoke, uh, you know, a, you know, yeah. well, I appreciate passionately that. about that. I mean, I go back how Lexington was built, and I've been here all my life. Before 1950, we only had a population of 25,000. When they built IBM, it built Lexington. I know if I said the horse farm is Lexington. But I'm talking about what built downtown Lexington and built the hospitals with IBM. When IBM went away, we were on, we had, I look at it from a baseball standpoint. IBM was a home run. But then we started hitting a bunch of singles and the singles have been going great until this pandemic. 
And then when I look at the opportunities of what's out there in, in New York City and places where you have another, possibly an IBM or a company like that, exists, and looking, this pandemic is going to make them change their future too. They're going to look out for what's best for their employees. The health issue becomes an issue here. Lexington is a great place to live. And to me, this is the golden opportunity. If we're going to, I don't, I know we shouldn't wait. We should go on and be aggressive and proactive and say, we want you to come to Lexington. We want to build another chance of another, the guy, gentleman said that this isn't a great place for a large man. I disagree because IBM built this city, built St. Joseph's Hospital, built St. Baptist, because every one of them people had heart attack from working so hard. I just think there's a golden opportunity there. We do have a lot of good opportunities here, and I've been preaching for five, six years because I used to be a commissioner of housing, building, construction. The average age for a plumber is 65. The average electrician is 70. We need to, they make more money than most of these folks that come out of college. And to me, I think that's the job that we should tap into uh, as work the workforce to try to get those jobs back in the in the create. The home builders have done a tremendous job starting to class down on Loudon. But I just think this, and I don't, I try to make a positive in what the bad times are. And I think we have tools to make lessons to, we're 11 hours to the majority of the population in the United States. We've got an interstate and we got a golden opportunity to learn how we screwed up on Nicholsville Road to take it down out on Winchester Road. You can build houses inside on, on, on Winchester Road and you can have the manufacturer where people can go to work right there where they live or the job or whatever we find. And I just don't want to hold back and, and, and if this if it council has to make that decision and if you all think that's the direction we need to go or any kind of direction, I think Amanda and I will sell it because I know she's in fear as I am about the payroll tax coming up in the next two years. I know we can't fix home run tomorrow but I think to me we can be optimistic and say that we're going to be able to bring some of these folks down here that we never had the opportunity and I think this is a golden opportunity and I and I mean I could go on for hours about this because Tyrone and I talk about it all the time and I think Kevin I could not talk about this I just see that Lexington has so much potential to be one of the best places in the world to work and live right and with I, the Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was going to say with the with the two hundred fifty thousand dollar amount. I guess what I was poking at is: is there a reasonable argument that we could give all two hundred fifty thousand to do something that's appropriate, or do we split it up and allocate it to our needs? In other words, to Anthony's point, you know, there are some short term things that could happen that may be more that may be more re, uh, important in the nature of the crisis. Uh, I look at the the bill. I look at yeah. two hundred fifty thousand going to those trade jobs that I was just talking about. We, there are 60 years old, and I, and I don't, and I tell this story every time when I was in the housing building construction. I had a kid who turned 18, and another kid, they both, one of them went to college, the other one wanted to be an electrician. Both of them graduated at the same time. The kid who became an electrician had a houseboat, a, ha a house, and a, and a, and a car, fancy car. The kid who graduated from college is working at Amazon, paying a hundred and fifteen thousand dollar student loan, and making fifteen dollars an hour. It's to me, I just it might have been great when I was coming up, going to college with the thing. Maybe it's the cycles coming back around. We may have to go back and do the, the tough jobs that nobody likes, but the money's there. That I think to me, that's an idea of taking money and spending where those kind of uses could be useful too. So, uh, all this discussion. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Stephen. I would like to add just uh, two points. Uh, Builders, the Building Institute, is a grassroots organization, just of our memberships that said we see this need and we're going to have to figure this out and do it. And and the members of that organization pulled their money together, started a school. We didn't know what we were doing, but we knew what we could do. We knew what our skill sets were and how we could educate others and thrive. Now we're setting on a school that. Four years ago in our annual meeting, we were deciding whether or not that school was even gonna exist anymore because we weren't getting enough kids. There was work going on continuously inside of the high schools, uh, trying to get kids on those career paths. And now what we're seeing 
And um, we'll take all $250,000, by the way. But what, what we're seeing is that parents are seeing that. And so the grandmas are seeing that. And they're saying, man, this is a career path. And one of the most exciting days of my year is the graduation of those students because you can see it and feel it in a room how much it means to those families that not necessarily kids, there's anywhere from 20 to 30 to 40 year olds that are getting these licenses and actually creating a career for themselves. So uh, there's big things happening out of there. We do need more students uh, to be completely viable and, and stand on our own. But what we've done as an organization is realized that the Building Institute is gonna be the legacy of our organization. It's the thing that's always gonna stand on its legs because it's, it's motivated in doing things right and helping others. And our membership thrives on trying to grow this and make it known. But back to workforce development, I want to point out, if we're really having a brainstorming meeting right here, my house overlooks Avon. That is a 24 hour a day, seven day a week job sustainer of our community, without a doubt. I don't know what the noise is I hear at four o'clock in the morning, but something's beating and banging over there and somebody's working really hard at something. And I know that there's a lot of jobs over there. I know that there's a, that the state is involved in owning a, a ample amount of land for in expansion and growth. Living out in the rural area, uh, I go on Haley Road quite a bit. Those roads are built for tanks. You can't tell me they aren't. They're the, some of the widest interstate interchanges that you have in our community. We, I, don't, I don't know enough to know what efforts go into the Avon area, but I can tell you that is where jobs can be created quickly in our community is knowing and understand what's going on in Avon. Brad, I'm not, Brad, just real quick, I'm not sure if you, can you see when people raise their blue hands? I cannot. Okay, Amanda's had her hand up for a while. So well, I was coming to her next. Okay, she I was going to say just real quick as a as a note, instead of the blue hand, probably just best to jump in there since Brad or or wave your hand. You can't, yeah, and just wave. And just wave your hand. I've, I've noticed Jordan thinking hard here, so I look. I'm going to look to him to see what's going through his mind. It could even be messy, Jordan. You what? What are you thinking? All this discussion. Perception's reality. I'm just that's just kind of the way I look. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I echo a lot of what Stephen and, and Richard said. Um, you know, I coach soccer, so I think about what's going on with COVID um, in terms of parents making decisions on whether or not they want their kids to participate. Um, I had some difficult conversations yesterday, but I'm, I'm with Richard. I mean, I, I was at a, a meeting or a, an event last year where I think, Richard, you said the average electrician age is 70. I think Farmers is up there, too. I think it's like 65, 70. Um, and you know, I, I highlighted some things that Betsy Dexter from Chamber of Commerce that she's been meeting with Bay County Public Schools about, um, you know, partnering with business communities and pairing those kids with, with potential employers. So I think that that's, that's something I'm pretty passionate about. You know, I don't want to speak for all the other bankers, but I don't think we do a great job with that as a, in a banking industry. And Lexington is identifying juniors and seniors and um, you know, giving them opportunities in in banking, um, you know, I, I think that that's that's somewhere where I feel like we can grow uh, a lot as a city. Um, you know, we we've had interns from Bryan Station, we've had interns from from Henry Clay in the past, but you know, those kids don't end up staying with in, in banking. So I, I think that there's ways to bring that, keep that talent here uh, as opposed to them going to UK and then ended up in Charlotte or Atlanta or Nashville. Um, we can make those connections when they're younger and then try to keep them in the city. So Richard, appreciate what you said. Steven, same thing. Um, you know, happy to hear, happy to listen more and uh, I'll stop looking like I'm uh, pondering. <laughs> Anthony, let me go to, Anthony, let me go to um, uh, council member Bledsoe first and I'll come back to you, Anthony. So I, I was most interested in listening to everyone because I think I hear snippets from different people. Richard hears snippets from people in the community and hearing from you all directly, I think is really helpful. And um, we put the money in to have this discussion. What is the most impactful thing we could do with $250,000 
that fits the most urgent need. And all the things that you all have talked about are all things that are, that are really important, every single one of them. Um, I'm a working mom. I've got a seventh grader and a fourth grader. And, you know, the biggest thing I hear about from all my friends in general who are all also working is what are we going to do and how are we working together to figure that out? Is that our kids go here Monday and then I'll work Tuesdays or we, we swap and that kind of, um, that is really, is challenging on a good day. And it's really hard for women or other, or whoever's doing that with their kids um, to do that networking is, is challenging and not everyone has that kind of support system to help them. So I think that is critical. And one of the things that Tyrone said that I wanted to pitch back to you all for maybe just conversation is, Tyrone, you said women and, and minority businesses are twice as fast to fail in this environment than others. And I guess I just wanted to hear a little bit more discussion from you all as to what, why you think that's the case. And then two, um, is that something that might be our most urgent um, uh, net to throw out, I guess, is the question. So I'm just curious for that, for that conversation. So, so uh, can I take that one, Tyrone, just a portion of it? What I'm going to say actually kind of dovetails on what you're saying, Councilmember Bledsoe, but also highlights and emphasizes what Councilman Maloney said and, uh, of course, what Stephen has said as well. So I encourage everybody to take a look at the documents in the Google Drive for the Education and Economic Outlook Committee of the Mayor's uh, Commission right now. There's a presentation done in there, uh, PowerPoint done by Allison Davison, looking at our economy and looking at gaps in our economy in particular. And let me just read some of the ones that's the highest bars where it's the highest amount of need. Healthcare practitioners and technical occupations, management occupations, business and finance. So there you go, Jordan. Uh, construction and extraction companies. Okay, um, installation, maintenance, and repair. So again, we're getting back to this, this area where we're saying, you know, we have a shortage of individuals who have skilled labor talent and you're working with their hands. Um, is there an opportunity to do that, to put some money toward programs that, it, that get that stimulated, but in particular, because of the gap? And here's one of the other things that we learned in this process. We looked at where the PPP money, the payroll protection program money went, and not much of it at all went to minority businesses. Not much at all. It's almost, it's embarrassing, really, to look at the numbers. And so, you know, Councilmember Bledsoe, you, you ask why that is. That's exactly why this commission was formed. There are some things that we have to admit to ourselves in this community that we need to address. And we also have to address the fact that for whatever reason, you know, there are racial concerns and people have not benefited as others have. The data in this information proves that it shows it. Take a look at the information we've got out there and you'll see. But, but what I think I'm, I'm going to lay out here is we're seeing a very common theme needed. We're seeing an opportunity to help correct an issue that was missed by PPP. And so does it make sense? And one of the other things that we've talked about, we've talked about apprenticeship programs, you know, looking at the skill sets that we have and what we need in this economy, you know, clearly things that are related to agri agriculture, um, ag tech, you know, there's a great opportunity for software development companies. I mean, these, take a look at the occupation gaps that's here, and you'll see that we're kind of going in this conversation in the right direction of where we think we need to stimulate growth and activity. Tyrone, you have a comment to that? You want to add to it? No, oh, I think I think Anthony hit the things that I, that I was going to. Just just one uh, just one area, you know. Uh, I'll bring it I'll bring it forth to what's going on now. You know, we're administering this um, uh, stimulus grant that the council you know put together in a in a very quick fashion, and I thought, uh, but I still think a very thoughtful fashion. And here I am, you know, in the middle of it. And I can't, it, it, you know, a uh, council member talked about uh, infrastructure and uh, having, uh, you know, and having connection with people and that kind of thing. So many people were in the middle of this thing. Just as of yesterday, I, I had like 20 calls of people said, man, I wanted so much to get involved with that, you know, but I'm a minority business and, and I, I just couldn't do it. You know, I, I couldn't get it. I couldn't get involved uh, because I, I'm, a, I'm a one or two person show and I'm doing everything. So I think that's what you get into with uh, women and minority businesses that they that they um, 
they don't have that infrastructure and uh, you, you'll get the same thing with education whereas you know you're not going to you're not going to get four mothers together that are going to be able to you know uh, you know take their kids a couple days here and there so they can go to work and and so it's a real it, it, it really becomes a socioeconomic thing that we have that we have to acknowledge and even for these businesses and some of them thought they were doing very well and I'm listening to some of these stories on the phone yesterday as I as I'm taking calls and um, I just let them know that you know it's uh you know it, it's not over you know we're in the middle of it we're assessing it and there, there may be some more funds out there but it's just to make it, it at first it, it seemed amazing to me that people wouldn't jump on the bandwagon and it wasn't because they did not want to is because they were trying to find the time to operate their business and go ask for so-called free money at the same time. You know, they didn't think they had the time. And I think you will find that up and down the spectrum, whether it's education or job hunting or, or running a business when it, come, when it comes to small women and minority owned businesses. I mean, it, it's, it's a social economic uh, of kind of a conversation that we, that we have to attack, probably all across the country. Yes. I, I... It, it probably relates to the working class, just as you said, Tyrone. It's like, hey, how can I even, not only do I not know what to do, I don't know who to ask, but I got to work at the same time. And I read through all that PPE uh, jargon, and it was made for corporates. You know, it, were, it really <laughs> yeah. was. What The forms you had to fill out, what you had to do, if you, you had one opportunity as a self-employed person to perhaps be able to get some of that money, and it wasn't much if you right. were. Uh, so it's, it's very hurtful to know that, um, it's in fact impacted the minorities in that way that they had, that there was an opportunity out there and they couldn't expand on it. Uh, and hearing this, we're dealing with parents needing to get back to work. We get dealing with kids wanting to, uh, expand their educational horizons and, and maybe that's a method for this money to be used to make sure those kids that they aren't, they don't lose those educational opportunities based on uh, not being able to afford it. Um, so what mechanisms do we have to get in? Just an example of my own life. My, my child is going to UK this year. Through this COVID, it gave us a really good opportunity to have discussions that we probably wouldn't have had uh, if we weren't dealing with this and said, hey, what all the things are you interested in life? Because maybe college, it, this isn't going to be an exact college ex experience. I hate to break it to you, uh, Slade, my daughter, but your college experience going into this year is not a real college experience. And if you think your <laughs> online learning is going to be identical to what you did from <laughs> March to May, you are sadly mistaken. Yeah. <laughs> this is okay. going to be different from you. So we identified that, Hey, Who's she wants position? to get her esthetician license. She's going to, she wants to get her real estate license. So we're shortening her workload and she's pursuing those things that she may have never pursued in life, but she's able to attain those licenses during this moment because she got to think about her career just a little bit harder than she would have otherwise. Yeah. Good. Yeah. That's great. Council member Bledsoe, did you make a hand motion? Oh, you're good. So here's a question. Here's a facilitator's point of view. I, I hear, uh, you know, good alignment amongst this board that uh, short term, urgent, immediate impact is in the workforce. It, you know, education's tied to it, but getting people back to work. What I haven't heard is the housing story. What, we have opportunity zone, neighborhoods and transition. I know you all know that it's important, but how does that fit into this conversation and eventually in the discussion of this $250,000 allocation. What, what's the thought on uh, that we need to be aware of as a board about the housing challenges we have? I mean, I've been in affordable housing for 25 years and this legend is not affordable. And I worked for REACH, I was the president there. Housing has an impact. And to me, the example I was gonna give is if we were to build out Winchester Road, it just and we would to put jobs on the interstate and put the, the houses on Winchester Road, I think the, the numbers would be great. And to me, that's how you look at where you can to build these houses because this infield redevelopment and it's causing PG people, Council Member Brown, all these problems. It people, I mean, you go down Elm Tree Lane, you got a house that 
was condemned, but now it's worth a half a million dollars next to a house that's only worth $80,000. It's causing problems, and it's causing those neighborhoods, and, then, and PG has a right, and Ed Holmes is right. They, this, is, this is major stuff. But to fix some of that, sometimes you've got to go down where we, I'm not, I'm being poet using what the Bible says, rural land management, they predicted 30 years ago that this was going to happen. We need to follow that rural land management rule and go out and try to solve some of this problem. For the, and it goes back to what, what Stephen hired and Amanda Blusto. I think of not, I didn't have any kids, but I think of their kids and their future. My family, took, my father took care of us and everybody but I don't know, I worry about what Lexington's gonna be able to take care of these kids. And to me, I think there's an opportunity in housing and Stephen knows about it. If, if you build the job, the houses will, be, will come. And to me, I just think there's, there's so much opportunities for the future and, and, and it could be for the next 30 years, if we, 40 years. And if that works, then we go down Lee, then we go down to Newtown Pike. I mean. And I don't mean, and, and I know everybody loves the horse industry and I think it's a great, but I think it's a slow dying industry. And we've got to be prepared to have a backup plan. If those industries start going and, and it may not be, may be 20 years or whatever, but this gives us a chance to move 20, 30 years down another way and then come back with a plan. If it worked well on Winchester Road, it could work well on Newtown Pike or someplace like that. Council member Bledsoe, you have a comment? Well, I just, when you say housing, I want to say housing affordability, and this is why I say that. I think there are a lot of families in Fayette County who have one and a half people working, meaning they have one full-time person and they may have another person who's either working full-time or working part-time in a flexible position where they're doing real estate or contract work or something else where they have flexibility. And what the question I, I guess would throw back is, if you've got people who are saying, I can't now do that second income job because of the kids being at home or other things, now being able to afford that nice house in this area, and I mean nice, just basic house. I'm not talking about the million dollar homes. I'm talking about the, the 250 to $400,000 homes that have now skyrocketed in prices. I mean, people are selling homes in, I, I, I don't understand. I mean, I know there's, there used to be 4,000 homes. Now there's 1,300 in the market right now, which charges the demand goes up, the market goes up, and the affordability issue could now goes, you know what? If we're not going to have two incomes because we don't know how long this is going to last and we need to be at home now now our decision making as a family unit has changed and now we're thinking maybe we do need to downsize so we don't have as much expenses or we may not be able to do this or that and i think that domino i think it's real it just in conversations i'm having with people and i'm i might be the only one having them but i think that that's an issue if we're not going to have people working on that on that ancillary position that helps make the affordability work yeah that's right. And, and so it might, it might be a question of, of what type of housing we're building up right now too, right? So when you start making decisions on understanding that, you know, you, there's no point investing a lot of money in a house that will all soon be too big, for example, or the type of housing that we have. Uh, maybe there's an opportunity to redo that and think about that strategically. Uh, one of the things that's going to come out as an outcome for us is um, and this relates to the hub zone conversation, is, is we have uh, developed an incentive that, that companies can receive for doing business with MBEs in the opportunity zone or in hub zones. So we fixed two issues. And so maybe, maybe that money could be used, some of that money could be used to create that incentive uh, because obviously we're gonna turn a lot of attention into the opportunity zone. There will be a financial benefit that those companies who come in there uh, will receive but how do we make them say, okay, when I have a choice of who I can work with to do my, you know, my subcontracting work, how do we direct that to where it might be an opportunity for an MBE to come into play? Um, the other thing I thought about too, we, we're, we're thinking about our kids and, um, and I know Fayette County Public Schools has stepped up to, to, to get Chromebooks for kids that obviously we're going to be dealing with uh, virtual learning here for, for at least the short term. I don't know how much of the school year. Should we also hold some back to make sure that on the back end, we don't need to come back and support some of that? And what I mean by that is, you know, we've done, we've done some, some projects too 
particularly target like, uh, you know, the East End, Cardinal Valley, you know, you're looking at your census tracts and you see where areas need a little bit more help and assistance. You know, this is a big deal. Um, if you're, if you have to now learn at home and you don't have internet and you don't have a computer, it's quick to get behind, really quick. So, you know, maybe we need to, to look to see if we need to fill some of those gaps. It's an immediate hit, but it helps us in our future because we've got to develop a workforce. They've got to be educated and we can't afford to let this situation have a segment of our society fall way behind because of lack of access and or tools. So just a thought. Yeah, great comment. And what are you thinking here? You've soaked, you've been soaking it in. What are you thinking? Give me a moment again. <laughs> um, no, I think absolutely some of the inequities that we're seeing, and again, I'm going to go back to COVID because these inequities have obviously been exacerbated by the pandemic. Um, and different types of businesses are feeling them in different ways. I particularly want to hit on, you know, how the PPP process um, was clearly difficult for a lot of people who were busy actually working their businesses, people without a large employee base. And I definitely think when we're looking at how to spend our money, um, filling in some of those gaps and helping some of those businesses that were unable to complete all of the processes that they could have because they couldn't dedicate the executive staff to do it or they couldn't hire someone to do it for them is going to be really important. And looking at um, you know, what we want our businesses to look like, an equitable city where people have the same opportunities. So going back a little bit from the housing portion, particularly back to some of the uh, minority and women-owned businesses um, to look at, you know, I think our money can go a long way in helping some of those businesses that are small and struggling, not only because of the pandemic, but that had a harder time to start with and that we have an interest in seeing our city support. Good, uh, Victoria, you had a comment? Yes, I did, thanks so much. Um, so I've been listening a lot, got some great comments here, and I think it's really a nice time for us to pivot and really understand kind of what our issues are, so I'm really glad we're doing this. The first and foremost thing to me is schools. You gotta get them back up and going. I mean, that's really gonna be where you make your biggest impact, you get the kids, back in, then the parents can go back to work. Because um, the workforce of so school and the workforce development are both huge. One thing I did um, pull out of the um, conversations that we had with the three is the social media aspect of it. You know, we gotta get creative. And, and social media is a great way, a great tool to use to get our message out. I'm new to this board, and I'll be honest, I really didn't know much about what what you all did or what much what the city did at all and so getting that word out is extremely important so I think that is one way you can definitely spend and get a great impact um, into the community you know Amazon what did they just come out um, last week um, and they had the biggest you know people were spending on Amazon so how do we get those people to spend our little shops that we have here. Don't go out to Amazon, spend here. And so you can use the social media campaign to really, really funnel that. I need to know you're open before I'm gonna get out and go buy um, you know, a $50 hairdryer. I need to know that you're open for business and, and you do that by letting people know via social media. And so that's one way that I would, um, I would suggest getting these funds out. I want to say one thing and then I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to be done for the rest of me. <laughs> but, but, but Victoria is absolutely on target. One of the other things that's going to come out as an outcome is we need to have, and, and, and the argument has been both paper and electronic, but obviously I kind of prefer electronic because you got to keep it fresh. But a listing of those minority businesses in our community, most people have no idea who they are or where they are. <laughs> and so, we, we, we have an outcome here to talk about developing a tool and a system to be able to make that public for the community. That's, that's all about letting everybody know what the opportunity is here in our community. Perhaps some of that money could go help fund that. So, you know, I, I absolutely agree with you, Victoria. And, and it's, it's how we take care of our, our businesses that are right here. We know that they all need a little help. I'm fortunate, I'm blessed, my company's essential. So we haven't really lost any work opportunities. And quite frankly, we have a lot of people who work for us who are technicians. Again, that skilled trade. 
those guys are making really good money and they're doing it every day in the midst of this COVID. But as a result of the fact that I've been blessed and to be able to keep working, now I need to go in the community and see who else I need to bless to keep them going. You follow me? Okay. I'm Great comment. So here, here's an assignment for everybody. So this is for everybody. I need at least two to three people to, to do this. So you remember that test you took a long time ago where you read the paragraph and you have to describe and give it a title? So as a board, we're looking for alignment. We're going down a path to, to make decisions on how to allocate this money. So from what you've heard today from all your fellow members here, how would you sum up our alignment? I heard a lot of alignment. How would you sum up the alignment that we may have at this point that we would be eventually giving advice to, guidance to the, the people who, the, the organizations that receive this money? We'll talk about how much they get later or soon, but what is this, your summation of our alignment as a board? I need two or three people to do that. Who wants to go first? Um, I can just jump in real real quick, Brad, uh, because I think that a lot of uh, um, really necessary conversations are coming out of this dialogue here, but, you know, to what Anthony said and to what Steven said and, and Jordan with, you know, we're talking about women in minority owned businesses. We're talking about trade. We're talking about, you know, skills and we're talking about, you know, what can we do to create an immediate impact um, sooner than later. And, you know, the Fayette County given, iPads and stuff to keep school going and education going like it's it would seem to marry a lot of the thoughts to have you know what if there is some sort of allocation to not just the Fayette County type schools but what other schools are creating trades type of jobs and what other what other what are the jobs or what are the companies that are uh, women and minority owned businesses that can benefit from that immediately how do we secure some of this to make sure we're benefiting that pathway, I guess. Right, and Kevin, just to make sure I'm correct here, this, we're, we're gonna be talking about $250,000 going to these three organizations, correct? Mm -hmm. So right. to your point, Michael, and everybody else, we're, we're, we're looking for that this money is applied to what this board is, is identifying as the most critical. And so, I think, and, and Brad- plenty of challenges, but go ahead. Let me add just one quick phrase and I'm going to look at Chad kind of for guidance on this. One of the things David Barbary always impresses when you're, when you're looking at this money, statutorily, it has to be spent in a way that is beneficial to the government as well. So it has, well, however we spend this, by state law, the money we give into these organizations has to go to an effort that is beneficial to the urban county government. Chad, am I saying that correctly? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Well, that's probably, that shouldn't be complicated though, right? That should be pretty easy with most things we've discussed here today. Well, I, I think you, you I, I agree, but I think, you know, when we start getting into the discussion about laptops for students, that may be outside the scope of okay. economic so that's development our funding. And, and maybe the outer worthy, edges. Of and I want to reiterate, I mean, obviously worthy, especially in today's learning environment, even more so. But it's probably those type of things are outside the scope of this money. They would have to go to a project by one or all three of the organizations. Okay, look, we're not far from being having pretty good alignment. Who are a couple of other folks who might want to give us a summation of where this board is aligned to give advice and guidance to recipient of these funds. Remember that great SAT question? You read the paragraph. What did they all? What did what did they say? Anthony, you know the answer to this. I can tell. I can look. I can see it. You know, you're not going to do it. Play poker with Anthony. He's he's his face is just telling you he's got something to say. <laughs> No, I'm gonna give I'm gonna give others the opportunity. I've talked to someone. Someone give it to you. Give me the <laughs> summation of where this board is aligned, and then as we decide about what to do with these dollars, the guidance that's gonna go along with it. The board believes what? Stephen, what are you thinking? Come on, Stephen, you got it. give us give us a summation of what this board just just talked about.
Stephen, you're on mute. Oh, you're on mute. I said the board believes children are our future. Now, I think I think that all of us uh, in our hearts want people to have opportunities uh, and to grow into careers. Yeah. So that we the, the board has the benefit of of two hundred fifty thousand dollars to allocate to three or to three organizations in some manner, and I've heard a lot of emphasis on addressing the workforce needs as the right catalyst, as the right motivator. $250,000 is not gonna fix our housing issue. It's not gonna fix our, our business issues at play, but it sure can impact a whole lot of people. So is that a fair comment? That does the board agree with that? We believe the best allocation and use of this money needs to go to that purpose. Housing is very important. It cannot be forgotten, but we're saying that the urgency and the priorities associated with things that can help the workforce. Obviously, the organizations we give the money to will, will solve that and make recommendations to this board. But as, it sounds like that's what we're believing. But Council Member Bledsoe, you, you, what are you thinking right now? That's a dangerous question to ask. Um, <laughs> that's what our facilitator does, is ask <laughs> questions. I think, I think that's the challenge. I think I hear a lot of agreement on workforce, meaning how do we help women in, in minority businesses su succeed? And how do we help people have a workforce to get people to work from? And, and those two things are intricately aligned. And how do we help put a net, put a, I say a net out to help support them when there's not an infrastructure and there's not a something in place to be that support system? The question is, how do we do that? And how do we put money towards that initiative that will help, help that issue um, quickly? And I think, I think, what, when it helps the government, it's payroll. If people are working, that helps the government, period. And if that means, you know, providing support systems for the kids who don't have a place to go so their parents can work, that in turn helps the government because now that, that those individuals are, are making money and can be employed. If that's a way to help provide better networking for our minorities and women businesses in some kind of form to get them into the door where they can be where they can do more trading, where they can do more helping from buy from each other and grow inside. How do we help provide that mechanism to help that system work better? Um, those are the things that I think that I hear us all talking about. I just don't know, you know, when I think out loud, I think, you know, Commerce Lexington may do a really good job of, of congregating those internal pieces together and helping them facilitate buying from each other. It may be a completely different mechanism that we use to try to support the after school or school programs um, through the city maybe to do some of those kind of things. And I think the key is working with our, with our nonprofits and with our business communities to help that initiative. I mean, I don't know. Those are my, those are my thoughts. No, yeah, those are good thoughts. thoughts. Really good thoughts. Those are good thoughts. I think we, we may have earned our place to be able to start to allocate this money at this point. Um, so this is where you have to recall the, proposals and the presentations you have. Go ahead, uh, Councilman. Uh, I want to echo what Councilmember Busso says. I agree with the minority and the women. And also, we, there's a shortage of CDL license. There's a shortage of what kind of jobs. This is government money. And, and I don't mean to say, but our budget is like 365 million a year. That when you start talking about giving computers to the schools, and I mean, I take their budget is $700 million a year. They represent 40,000 people. We represent 360, over 300,000 people. So their, their budget is double what our budget is. And I don't want to get into the school because I have my opinion on some of the school problems when they're going out buying buildings that were for sale for $3 million and they paid $7 million for it last week, a couple weeks ago. I just think those are the problems. I just don't want to get in that argument. But I agree that we need to keep the money where the minorities and women are, and also trades and CD license. We are, I sit, we need, uh, as a council member, I gotta look where we're lacking in our city. We're lacking drivers, we're lacking jobs. We have the jobs, but we can't fill them. We have, I look, if I'm gonna use taxpayer dollars for my, for the, I gotta see what also is gonna help the city. 
and sure. we don't have plumbers. We don't have HVAC. We don't have, we we're lacking a lot of those people. That's right. Because they're not there. So I just think to break those money into three sections like that, I just, I agree with David Barber on the on school. We just don't need to be spending money with, when they got more money than we got. So that's just. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Kevin. So ahead, Kevin. I, I want to kind of tag team with what Council Members Bledsoe and Maloney just said. Two quick things. Tyrone's been working for a couple of weeks now with his group, reviewing 156, 160 applications from small businesses. And most of those average around seven employees. And I say all that to say about half, and Elodie's on here, she could correct me, about half of those applications have come from either minority or women-owned businesses. So the, the need is documented. I mean, yeah. it's not only said the need, the need is documented there. Then, and we haven't done a geographic look at those, so we can't really tell you where from in town they're from. The second point, and, and this is the one that both council members just made as well, and kind of goes to Stephen's point. In our workforce grant program this year, we set half the money aside specifically for programs in certification and licensure. That won't begin to meet the need. And so if that's a point of emphasis, uh, then how do we go about looking to address that would be my question if that becomes a point. So we all, so I guess the real point is we're doing some of these things. So is the broader question, how can we combine a bunch of these so we have an effort going on that's multi-focused as opposed to the typical silo kind of uh, approach to, to what goes on? Yeah, I think we're getting close. I think we've got good alignment. We've checked for disagreement, but we may be close enough to say, how do we allocate this money? We have three organizations. You've heard from them all. You, they reintroduced themselves today. Uh, does anybody have a proposal or suggestion who could best, uh, best utilize the funds to get as close, you know, to get to deliver what this council has given us guidance? Well, let me jump in just real quick on that question to kind of frame it a little bit differently. It's not who, it's kind of what proposals we think would benefit because what we'll have to do is then go back to each of the three and say, what can you do? Can, do you have the money that you can match with and what can you do to meet these desires of this board? So there's another step is what you're saying. That's a good point. Thanks for the clarification. Yeah. So what are the comments to that end? Is what, uh, you know, our guidance being an emphasis on workforce development and the supporting factors of it. Um, thoughts about that? What, what action to that? What do you need from them? What do you want to hear from these organizations? Well, Richard isn't going to want, going to, want to hear this, but um, I highlighted a part of, cha of the, the Chamber's question, monthly questionnaire, the part with, with Betsy. She's the one that works with the schools. And I guess Fayette County Public Schools is going to hire a, is going to, a strategic partnership manager that I guess identifies current openings in Lexington and then tries to fill those positions with um, the high school students. So, I mean, I think that that's, that's kind of where I immediately went to in terms of workforce development and then jobs that are actually, there's vacancies now in Lexington and then trying to, you know, fill those jobs with, with students or with, with graduating students. Good, yeah, yeah. Uh, other comments? I think so what it sounds like Kevin's made a point was we're gonna be putting out guidance here. I, I don't know, between Chad and myself and, and maybe others here, our notes are gonna be very simple notes to these three organizations that the, the, the council has had a great discussion and debate. We've prioritized, we believe we know the areas that need the most support and we need to hear from each of them about how they would achieve that. Is that Sound right, Kevin? Did I state that correctly? Yes. Basically, how to can anything. achieve the value add? You can achieve the value add. So, does anybody would just get put us to give us a phrase that we want to make sure that is included in our board's guidance to these three organizations? Jordan, that was a great input. And other comments? I, I, I'm still trying to think about how uh, we can leverage uh, something that I, that I know the mayor is going to receive because it's going to come from my committee. Um, the opportunity to um, 
engage minority businesses uh, on the work that's going on in the Opportunity Zone. Um, and so if there's an incentive that could be built there so that whenever those companies come in, it'd be great if they are minority companies that come in, that'd be awesome, I, I don't know. But, but quite frankly, they might not be. And so with that being the case, is there a way that we can engage minority businesses on the projects that are actually gonna be utilized there to build the companies that's coming in? Great comment. Any other comments you want to make sure gets put into that guidance? Yeah, kind of piggybacking off of that, I think it's important, you know, to, because of the values that we've stated, to kind of think outside of the usual box. You know, yeah. we have a limited amount of funds. I think the biggest bang for our buck is actually in being able to affect some of these smallest of small businesses and businesses that are kind of at a disadvantage from the get-go um, because of their ownership, because of their size, because of their age. Um, and so, you know, I, I would reiterate, and I think this is particularly a message for Commerce Lex, which does a great job in funneling talent, but obviously is based on membership. And many of our smallest businesses and our newest businesses haven't had the funds or haven't really been able to see the payoff for them, particularly in joining that pipeline of membership. Um, and so I think there are a lot of businesses out there that particularly need our help that may not be in our ordinary network of folks that are yes. reached out to. And that's really, I think, where this money could make the biggest impact. And so um, I think that um, Urban League could be particularly useful in that being based in communities and um, knowing who are starting businesses on the ground. Um, so I, that's, that's kind of my input is to make sure that we're thinking beyond kind of um, more, I don't know, kind of the processes that we've always used and really thinking about, okay, who are the, the smallest, the newest uh, businesses that could really best utilize this money? Because that kind of money to a business like that is <laughs> And you know, Ann Toller's point, Ann Toller's point brings up a, a good one that, that we work with a lot and we've got to do a, a better job of articulating it's often thought that to get into the Commerce Lexington programs that they do for the city, that you have to be a member. No. Okay. You do not have to be a member. In fact, okay. it's specifically mentioned in their contract with the city that membership cannot be required. I don't think we do enough, uh, a good enough good job uh, of yeah. explaining that sometimes. Thanks, That's Kevin. great to know, Kevin. And, and maybe some social media advertising could be good because a lot of these newer businesses, they really rely on social media um, to get their own advertising out because, you know, maybe a website isn't, hasn't, that box hasn't been checked yet for a lot of businesses. So they go to Facebook or something first. So maybe we could look into some. Yeah, good clarification. Uh, any closing, other closing comments? I'll close this up. If any other final comments? I want to dovetail on what Ann Tyler just said, because it's, it's, I'm going to read the, the <laughs> I'm going to read it verbatim. Increase community access to a comprehensive minority owned business listing that will increase minority business owner awareness and then annual paperwork and the like, but it becomes a vehicle that's a, either a print and or print or we're gonna recommend print and electronic medium so that you can actually be able to find who the minority businesses are in the community. Yeah, that's, so people can make a choice. Make yeah. A good choice, yeah, that, that's, a fair, that's a fair comment. So good good comment. Anything else, Victoria, I saw your hand. You no, may just, no, 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 just no. no. Just a, uh, just looking at time, I'll, I'll turn it over. Thanks for letting me play with you here. No one growled at me, but you can still growl at me later on if you'd like. I, I've enjoyed getting to know everybody. It sounds like there's good alignment around the priorities. So that's a, that's a positive message. And hopefully uh, the three organizations stayed on and listened to this meeting, but we will still obviously follow up with them to make sure they, they heard this, count, this uh, board's uh, you know, a, a aligning thoughts. And then they get the the opportunity to solve the issues and to make the recommendations. And that's the great part. So with that said, I'll turn it over to you, Kevin, um, for closeout. Well, Brad, I was just looking real quick over at my screen and the answer to your question is yes, they did stay on. And Excellent. Well, they, they've heard the story then. So uh, that's, to, to that's good. Discussion. So what we will do is take this, uh, I'm looking at the calendar real quick to make sure I'm not going to misspeak. Well, we'll take this uh, conversation, which I, I, I really think was a good one. I hope everybody else does too, um, and kind of condense it down 
reach back out to those three uh, groups. I think what we would ultimately like to do is see if they could submit their proposals by the time we would meet on September the 1st uh, so that we could begin to address it at our September meeting uh, and we can see if we need to have further discussions like we've just had. I think this kind of discussion based on their submissions would be a good kind of in-depth discussion to have to get everybody's input as well, Brad. Um, and, and then we'll go from there. So as of right now, that would be the only um, item on a September agenda. And then we would go ahead and ask them as well about the requirement to meet the, meet the matching funds. Do we have another brainstorming uh, agenda item for the next month's meeting and um, perhaps we can dive into housing. That's a big subject. Uh, and I was talking a lot today, so I muted myself on those points, but uh, we need to understand the highs and lows and the pitfalls and successes of our community and housing. Ken, uh, I'm not putting that off. Can we do that in October instead of September? Definitely. And, and the only reason I say that is I want to give it enough time and I'm afraid with the other conversation, um, we, we might be somewhat limited on time for folks. We put it off for a long time. A no, couple I'm, more months. I'm literally just, I'm not asking for uh, very long. I'm just saying October to, to help kind of balance the agendas. Well, if there's nothing else, anybody got any comments? If not, um, I'm seeing nobody. So we will be adjourned. We'll get that information out to our three partners and let them begin their work. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Good job, Brad. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. You're All welcome. <laughs> Facilitation is always difficult. You did a good job. <laughs> I have fun doing it. I, it we have had a, a nice group of passionate, smart people, so that always makes facilitation fun and easy. Yeah, we, we weren't too quiet, were we? <laughs> no, that's good. I'm glad. So. And also, all of you should uh, should uh, would lose all your money in a poker game too. Yeah, I, I know. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's part of the new way to do it, isn't it? You're supposed to show your emotion via your face. Thank you, Brad. <laughs> sure thing. Okay.